Welcome to The Chem Doctor, and this is the second video in the series on uh, Beer's Law and the Spectrophotometer, or another, another term to use for the Spectrophotometer is the Spectrometer. All right, and you should use whichever one is more comfortable or whichever one rolls off your lips. All right, what I want to do in this particular video um, is basically deal with, with uh, two important issues. The first is, and, I, and I'll present these as questions, the first is um, what you see when you look at a substance that's generating a color. And then secondly, how do you find the maximum wavelength absorbed by that substance? So two issues, all right? So what I want to do to start is I'm going to go ahead and um, draw a picture of three samples here, all right? And in the first sample, which in your class, in your laboratory, whether it's high school chemistry, advanced placement chemistry, or general chemistry, you've probably already encountered a solution of copper sulfate. So that's what this is going to be. All right, and it's it's a nice sky blue um, solution. All right, and then for comparison, and I'll label these uh, with words in a minute. And then for comparison, next to it, I will um, will have a solution of let's see, yeah, this is pretty good. Uh, cobalt um, chloride. But note that both the copper ion and the co and the cobalt ion are transition metals, so they have d orbitals. All right, and then. Um, my third example will be a solution of um, iron 3 chloride. All right, so we have these three test tubes. Now let's see, I need this one here. The iron 3 is going to be fairly orange, yellow and orange. So let's see, I'll put some orange in there. All right, and we'll put in, uh, I'll add some yellow to this. I don't know if it'll make it, you know, it's sort of yellowish orange solution. All right, now the one on the far left is my copper sulfate. And it's the copper ion that's responsible for um, the coloration. Although how the copper interacts, like in this solution, it's actually a complex of copper ion and water. And how the copper ion and how the cobalt ion, ion and how the, uh, um, the iron 3 ions interact with water in, does in fact influence uh, their coloration. So this one here is going to be the cobalt um, chloride. And then my last one is iron 3 chloride. All right, so we have these three, these three different solutions. Now, let's start with the copper sulfate. You look at this tube, and it's clear cut. It's blue. But when we talk about um, the spectrophotometer and the fact that it obeys Beer's law, so remember, I'm going to put Beer's law over here. All right, and Beer's law says that um, if we know the absorbance of, of a particular solution at some wavelength, I'll just indicate that with X, that this is equal to um, A times B times C. Now, I outlined this in the last video, so if you're not sure what I'm doing here, you're going to need to go back. You really should watch the first video or watch these videos in sequence. So we talk about the copper sulfate solution absorbing uh, radiation and we see a blue solution the, the question is is the the coloration that we see actually the wavelengths that are being absorbed and the answer is no so up here on the right I have a color wheel and this the color wheel has uh, we, we're gonna use this um, two different ways one we're going to use it to identify the color that we see and then what I want to point out to you is 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 the actual color that's being absorbed is the complement to whatever this color is. So in other words, the copper sulfate is coming in blue. Therefore, the, the wavelengths that are being uh, uh, absorbed by the copper ion solution is in the orange range. All right, And specifically, the copper sulfate is going to be absorbing it in a, with a, a lambda max. And I'm going to talk about that issue in a minute around 620 nanometers all right and on the left here I have a chart that you use you can use uh, in a similar way we see that the copper sulfate is absorbed um, or that when we look at the copper sulfate solution excuse me what we see or what we observe is a blue solution um, and I'm on the wrong side of this thing let me just get over on the correct side so what we're seeing is blue 
All right, what is actually being absorbed is over here, and I'll put an asterisk by it, which is in the range of 600. Now, the, the key is that you need to understand is that we can't know exactly, looking at a color wheel, what wavelength is actually being absorbed by the copper ion in this solution. And when we talk about lambda, lambda max, that's what I'm going to cover next. Um, that will be the part where we figure out, okay, so how do we nail down that the absorbance maximum for the copper ion in the solution is 620? So let's turn to the cobalt. The observable um, coloration we see here is pink. And when we look over here, well, I don't have pink in this list, but we have something that's close, right? The, re the red. So most likely the cobalt is going to be absorbing in the blue-green area here. Uh, and if we come over, so here's our red. This is our observable. All right, and we see that the complement to it is the green. So our um, cobalt should be absorbing actually the cobalt ion in, in the green region here while it's transmitting in the pink or the red. All right, and uh, technically the cobalt is actually absorbing it at about 520 nanometers. And again, how do we come up with this number? Because when we're actually going to use this, uh, we're, we're actually going to use the spectrophotometer in the laboratory to define a concentration of something, then we're going to need to know the maximum wavelength absorbed for that particular substance. And, and so the second part of my video is how do we do this? How do we figure out, for example, that co copper sulfate is actually absorbing in the 620? while it's producing or transmitting in the blue, how do we figure out that the cobalt solution is absorbing in the 520 but uh, transmitting uh, in the red? Lastly, my, other, my last example is the iron 3, and we see it's coming in. It's transmitting in the orange. That's in this region here. Let me just change my color for that. So we're, we're transmitting here for the iron 3, which means that the iron 3 should be producing somewhere uh, it, or it should be um, it should be absorbing somewhere in the blue range here in the blue range uh, now I actually haven't done iron 3 myself in the laboratory but when I looked it up it's gonna be somewhere its max will be somewhere between 490 and about 430 somewhere in there and if we needed to know exactly we would actually do what I'm gonna describe next so what's the take-home message so far alright the take-home is when we observe a certain coloration uh, for a solution, that's the color that is actually being transmitted. And it's being transmitted because either all of the other wavelengths are being absorbed or the complementary color to the coloration being transmitted is the one that's being absorbed. All right, now, how do we figure this out? So. I'm going to focus on copper sulfate because that's the one that I use in the laboratory most often to train my students. And again, going back to the last video, generally speaking, in a teaching laboratory, like in a high school setting or university general chemistry, you're going to be utilizing a SPEC 20. All right, And uh, very quickly, the layout of that is going to be like this. So we're going to have a, basically what amounts to a glorified uh, light bulb. Okay, And light is light waves are generated off of that. Um, our sample uh, is going to be sitting in a cuvette holder, so we call this test tube a cuvette. And it's sitting in the cu whoops, uh, cuvette holder. All right? And the, the setup is computerized, so it knows how much light is going into the sample, how much light is coming out. So this here is, whoops, I'm going to, let me just change that color again. So it's going to be, here's the light going in, here's the light coming out. And as I explained in the first video, we end up with what's called transmittance, which is the ratio of I over I naught. And with some mathematical manipulation, we get to our absorbance. And the absorbance, in most cases, is what we're really interested in. So how do we figure out the maximum wavelength for a solution like copper sulfate that's actually absorbing in the orange range and transmitting in the blue range? So what you're going to do is get yourself um, a known molarity solution to this, which could be, for example, a 0.5 molar solution of 
uh, copper sulfate in uh, distilled water or deionized water. All right, and then what we're going to do with that is we're going to place it into uh, the spectrophotometer and we're going to collect absorbance data at a variety of different wavelengths. And in particular, so what I'll do is I'm just going to go directly to the graph. So we have a fixed concentration of the copper sulfate. On the vertical axis, we're going to be collecting absorbances at different wavelengths. And in terms of the wavelengths, we're going to start usually somewhere around 400 nanometers. This is going to depend somewhat on your spec 20. Um, let me do a better job writing that. So it's going to be, whoops, nanometer. So we're going to go from approximately 400 nanometers uh, out here to uh, approximately 700, uh, let's say 725 nanometers. And what I normally have my class do is uh, collect data every 5 or 10 nanometers. I let them decide on how they're going to do that. And one of the things that you want to be really careful with here is to blank the instrument between each and every single re uh, reading. So you're going to have basically two, two tubes set up. One of them is only going to contain distilled water, DH2O, the material that you actually dissolve the copper sulfate in. All right, And then you're going to have your tube of copper sulfate. And in a practical sense, what you'll do is first you're going to take, this is your blank, you're going to take the blank, you're going to put it in the instrument, and you're going to blank the instrument. Your instructor will show you how to do that. On, on, my, on the instruments I have in my laboratory, there, there's a button that is over on the right side of, of the vertical screen that you hit. And then you'll notice on the readout, it takes a second or two, and then the instrument shows you the zero reading. Then you pull out your blank, you insert the sample the way I'm showing here, and then you ask it to take a reading. Now, on the instruments I have, the reading is done automatically once you close the window. On some instruments, you'll have to like close the window or the, or the opening to the unit, and then you may have to hit a button to ask it to do this. And then it's going to give you an absorbance. Then you're on a, and I'm going through this on a practical scale. And I can't overemphasize the following. Then what I'm going to do after I've collected the absorbance information for that sample, you pull the sample out, you put the blank back in there, zero the instrument again, and then you tra you exchange your tubes again, and then take the absorbance. All right. Now, if you're efficient and the the team understands what they're doing, this is a relatively fast process. And then what you end up doing after you've collected the absorbance data is you plot it. And what you're going to see um, in, in the plot, if this was done correctly, is you're going to have a bell curve. All right, that's going to look something like this. All right, and in our case, when we come down for the copper sulfate, this value right here is going to correlate with an absorbance, which is at 620 nanometers. So now when we proceed to the next step of this, which would be, for example, to tell a particular teacher or professor what the concentration of copper sulfate is in a sample that they give you for which you do not know the molarity, you need to make sure that you have your spectrophotometer set to a fixed wavelength at the lambda max. So this is what we call the lambda max for the copper sulfate. And this needs to be done. You either need to know what this is for a particular sample you're characterizing, or you need to find it. So in the case of the cobalt chloride, that's how come I know that we're at, a, we're at 520. And that's how come I said regarding the iron that I'm not sure exactly um, where this value is but that what you're going to have to do is an, an experiment like this. So you, uh, you come up with a fixed concentration of the iron chloride, and then you take it through a range of different wavelengths, being, being very careful to zero the machine in between um, the units, draw your bell curve, and find your lambda max. Now, one, one thing left to, to say about this before I close my video, the, one thing you need to, the other thing you need to be certain about is that 
you're using a concentration, like I said here, it would probably be around a half molar of the, iron, of the copper sulfate. You need to make sure that this maximum um, absorbance is one, is one or less. And if, it is, if it's well above one, or actually in my class I tell them if it's above one, then they're going to need to come back to this and they're going to need to do a dilution and then repeat this experiment because absorbances above one are going to be out of the linear range of this instrument. And the whole point of this, in order for Beer's Law to work, the readings that you get have to have a linear relationship. So you need to make sure that your absorbances are one or less. Okay, And when I say less, uh, there's also a lower end to this, which is probably around 0.02 or so. I don't think, at least the way I feel about it, you don't want to be much below that for this type of an experiment on a spec 20, which is usually what you have in those labs. All right, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and close my video. You can find more uh, support videos at www.chemdoctor.org. Thanks for taking the time to watch my uh, presentation.